This is not intended to be a lecture. I will be asking some questions, and I hope if you have questions, you can feel free to go ahead and ask them up. You don't have to wait until the end to get my attention. I don't want you to forget, and I want people to address any of the concerns as they come up. So this is very, very open form as we as we go through. Thank you. Now this is this is important when we talk about with, with regards to doing community training in the environment. What's important is that we also realize who the first line of safety is, right? Your, the first line of safety is who? Is what? It's all of you. It's all the community members. So it's important to understand that everyone's eyes, everyone's ears, is the first security system. So always having an open being willing to speak and say something for is very, very important. Right. A little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Like I said, we're going to go a little bit quick. We're going to make sure that uh, we cover preparedness and response on, a, on an overview. And then we're going to be taking as many questions as possible. So, having your preparedness is, is broken into two parts, right? So understanding that you have to understand what your response plan is. Right now, as a community, we are working to develop a response plan with the leadership here and with many community members. So when that when that is completed, everyone can have a very clear understanding of what what the entire organization's response plan is by by segment, whether it's for the mosque or for the various schools. Everyone might have a slightly different uh, response plan based on the location of the building and by the population that that specific part of the, the organization is serving. So if we're talking about little children, the response plan for little children is going to be quite a bit different than the response plan for the community at large, meaning the adults during prayer time or doing eat or fit or something like that. So knowing the prior response plan is very important is knowing your exits, right? So one of the things that people always uh, overlook, when you, go, when you go somewhere, in your mind, that place that you enter, the main entrance, tends to be where you will default to if you have to leave, if there's an emergency. For example, when there was a large fire at the uh, club in Rhode Island, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, a pulse. You know, forgive me for getting a little bit graphic. A large portion of the bodies that were recovered from that fire, does anyone guess where they were found? Say again? Oh, a rear exit? The main entrance. The main entrance. Under duress, your mind will default to the thing you remember most recently. And so understanding what the exits are, primary and secondary exits, and importantly, the thing about out of the box, emergency exits, that's important, right? So sometimes your exit won't be the door. Sometimes if you're on the, on the first, floor, first floor or second floor, your exit might need to be a window. So having that in mind is always very, very important. It's part of your plan. Knowing what your exits are based on your location to the threat and to the various entrances and exits in the building. And of course, who you are with. If you're by yourself, your options are different than when you are with your family, right? You might not always be able to hop out a window when you have your family members and children. So these are things you have to be thinking about on a regular basis, right? Determining ahead of time whether you can barricade the space that your hands are for. We're going to go through that a little bit, knowing what may be covered and what concealment. How many people here have the emergency phone numbers for fire and police in their phone? Everyone kind of does, right? Because we know that 911 is the emergency response number. What happens if you're someplace and you're on your cell phone and you dial 911? We watch a lot of TV, a lot of movies. You dial 911, and the local police department picks up the phone and they say, What's your emergency? If you're on a cell phone, that doesn't always happen. 
When you're on a cell phone and you dial 911, that call goes to the state police. And that state police dispatcher is not local people always. That state state police dispatcher might be in Brandon. So now your, your emergency call needs to go to a state police dispatcher who gets your information and then sends that information to your local police department. And then your local police department will dispatch fire EMS police to your location. So that lag in time can become critical. One thing that I do, besides having the emergency button in your phone, I always have the phone number, the non-emergency phone number saved in my phone or wherever I'm at. And I, I label it 000, zero, zero police. It's going to be at the top of my contact list. If I need to call from my cell phone, I'm always going to be able to find it easily. And that non-emergency number very easily can take the same information that they would in your name alone. It's going to be a more immediate response. A lot of police officers don't like people to know that. Which part? Save the local non-emergency phone number for your police. Save that. So you live in Holden? You have the non-emergency number, save it in your phone in some way that puts it at the top of your contact list. A A A or 111, whatever. Now, in Holden, if you dial from your cell phone, it'll be a state police. If you dial from the landline, it'll go to your local dispatch, local police. Some towns have a computer system that automatically will transfer that number to local, but we don't always know which towns do that. Yes. Well, it'll, the phone, your phone number will make a difference. It'll dial 911 and it'll go to the state police. Okay, how you, how you, you, avoid the you call directly to the holding non emergency phone number, whatever that prefix is. That's the best way to do it. Okay? Again, this is just to minimize the response time. You can dial panic button on your phone, it'll go to the state police. But we have some options to understand. Right. Prepare, preparedness and response. When you get into the response aspect of it, it's your typical thing that you hear about, it's full serve about, it's your run, hide, fight, right? Evacuate, barricade, or swarm. In a later event, what we're going to do is we're going to work a lot more on the uh, barricade, all three aspects, the barricade and the swarming aspect. And you're going to get up and you're going to get involved. Because really the best way to learn these things is to be physically active and try to take part. These are some of the things that we're going to be speaking about at a later time that's more in depth. All right. So the difference between a tactic and a strategy. A strategy is something that we are working on with the leadership here to develop your emergency action plan. Strategy is your large overarching plan to accomplish a goal. Right? What we want to do is improve long-term safety in the entire organization across the, the three parts of it. Right? And there are multiple steps involved to, to develop that strategy. The tactics are all the little things that you do when you're trying to get to that endpoint. The tactics are the things that you do during an active threat scenario. Tactics are something like knowing to go to your immediate exit. A tactic would also be knowing that the exit might be too far for you or because you have people with you that cannot you cannot transport quickly. So your alternative to evacuate would be to try and lock down to barricade. These are tactics. There are very, very many of them, and none of them are right or wrong. It's very, very fluid. 
because the situation under a threat is always very clear. So understanding how these three things turn here. Understanding, evacuating, and barricading, and eventually, if we arise, attacking that individual. Knowing how fluid that can be is very important because that affects your ability to respond quickly. One of the things we have to try and make sure that we're always understanding is that the more we do a thing, the more we think about a thing, the more integrated that thing becomes. And there's a, thin, there's a very thin line between being conscious and prepared and being paranoid and uncomfortable, right? And unfortunately, safety and comfort are often on opposite sides of the spectrum. And I'm trying to find a comfortable, relatively comfortable medium where at any given time you can fluidly switch from safety to comfort. And what we're, that's what we're trying to do right now. So understand the tactics of the individual steps that you take to improve and move yourself towards your goal, and the strategies that more are in play. And we'll be talking about those two right here. This is more of a time to fit. This system of associating colors with threat level and response was developed quite some time ago, 30 to 40 years ago by Lieutenant Colonel in the military. And what it does is it allows us to try and categorize things and people. Right? You can categorize others, you can categorize yourself, and you can categorize an environment. So what this means is that let's talk people right now. Let's talk externally. Right? When we're talking about white. This is individual. I bet right now, everybody knows someone that's like this all the time. Right? Particularly our children. And, and I, I will make an addition. And I hope my wife never sees this. This, this is her. Every time you get out of the car, phone like this, walking. And I have to constantly remind her, you know, please pick your eyes up so you can see. Because if she's doing that when she's with me, she's doing that when she's not with me. Luckily, it's going to have a more impact on your daughter, and I thought I'd have to be a little more careful. But people who have a right? What happens is, during the first scenario, you move through these quickly, right? Some people, and stay right here. And if, if the emergency scenario would take place, they would go from this to where to this. Right? Then the last means uh, it's complete loss of cognitive function. It's a complete shutdown. Right? So when you've seen things on TV or movies where something traumatic happens and people freeze and they don't know what to do, that's what that, that reference is. And often, none of us know how we're going to respond, right, when things go down, until they go down. Or unless you've been in scenarios before that are high stress or traumatic. What we're trying to do is create an understanding where we, as individuals and as communities, we are fluidly we're fluidly moving from here to here. And maybe here on the team. So an example of that is if being, being a military person and in law enforcement, a lot of people who know they're very uh, mounted, right? Sometimes, right? And they're going to make them wrong. I'm always, I'm always, I'm always prepared. I'm not. You can't be. It's not human nature. If all of the time you were like this, you were stressed out. You you probably should see someone with their it's not healthy. First of all, all 
also eventually you become desensitized to it. Right? If you think everything is a threat all the time, you always do this all the time. After a while, you stop paying attention anyway. Right? So now your level, what used to be this, becomes this again. Because psychologically, we can't maintain those high levels of alertness all the time. Number one, number two, every time you take your attention off of what's happening around you, you're no longer aware. For example, you're walking to your car, you need a store. Okay? You see your car over there, and you go to it. Right? While you're walking, you look in, you're looking around. Make sure everything's okay. That's great. You're yellow right now. You're alert. You're paying attention. The second you go like this, you start pushing buttons. The second you put your eyes on your door or you open up your trunk to put groceries in it, you're no longer paying attention. So to, to imagine that you can stay at that level of alertness all the time, it's not realistic. What we can do is understand that and fluidly move back into that state whenever possible. We can be conscious of it. So that means that when you go and you take your eyes off of your environment, you know that you have to get your eyes back up too. You don't just zone out, right? You say the word. You don't hang out with this and you can't keep your trunk in your car. What would you think? Rummaging through things, right? So you pay attention and you flow out and back in. You build up. And if it's it, it a large task, you do what you have to do. Come up, look around a little bit more. Go back to what you're doing. Understand? Understanding that you can flow in and out is very, very important. Until something draws your attention, until something is out of the norm. There's a saying that I learned some years ago that stuck with me forever, and I will never stop saying it. Right? What we're trying to be open to is absence of the normal and presence of the abnormal. Absence of the normal, presence of the abnormal. What that means is that we're all very accustomed to most of our environments. Right? You know what your workplace is like on a regular basis. You know what the what things are like here on a regular basis, at home, so forth and so on. Even if you go shopping, right? Whether it's at the mall or grocery shopping, you're relatively accustomed, accustomed to the layout of that facility, to the lighting. Hopefully, you're paying attention to the exits, right? To the culture of that environment that you're in. So you are then aware when something changes, right? Absence of the normal, meaning, for example, you're used to there being lights to it being well lit when you go to work. And one day you go to work and the lights, either in the parking lot or the main entrance or the side entrance, they're not on. Absence of the normal. That should alert you and move you here. For a little bit, because it might be nothing. It might just be a light that's out. It could be something else. One of the mistakes that we make as humans is we talk ourselves out of things. Right? How many times have we thought something was up and then didn't listen to a little voice on the shoulder only to find out? That something really was up. We talk ourselves out of believing that things are a threat. Because it's stressful. Because we don't believe it's going to happen to us. We don't believe it's going to happen here. Until it does. So when you have things that alert you, and if you think this to yourself, absence of the normal presence of the abnormal, absence of the normal presence of the abnormal, if something if someone is present someplace that they've never been before, presence of the animal. If a package, a bag, 
a suitcase, a vehicle is present in a place that you've never seen before, presence of the animal that animal. Understand? So that should alert you, that should heighten your sense of alertness. And now you pursue that a little bit. You see the little signs over here, right? See something, say something. This is the way to get you to the point where you are saying something. Understanding that things should get your attention. And if you can start thinking about it regularly, you'll be very surprised at how open you become to your environments. How much more you start taking in. People, places, in and yourself. In this environment, you know each other, you know a lot of people in the community. I bet a lot of you not only know someone like this, but you know someone that if stuff went down, if something went down tonight, you probably know somebody who could be right here really quick. Right? Someone ready to go. So in my world, when we move around and we observe environments and people, I start thinking to myself, okay, that guy over there is not going to be much talk to me or something like that. That dude over there who's been watching everyone walk in and out of this space, well, it's either the bad guy or if something goes down, I'm going to go get his help. You understand? What we're looking for is ways to categorize people. Sisters, you know, you know which sister you can grab and say, help me, I need you, right? And you know which sisters are going to be any help to anyone. Understand that, and that's okay, because not everybody is accustomed or able to be involved directly in solving problems. Some people really need to be to go lock doors. Someone's job should be to go call EMS or take the children and put them someplace, right? So the idea of everyone being a hero, that's not true, it's not possible, it's, it's not what we want. We need people to be able to do everything. Right? So being aware of yourself here and other people is very, very important. Even if you want to be thinking about with regards to your plan, right? Now, the overarching organization, right? Most of the Islamic Center is going to have a response plan. Each one of you should also have a personal response plan. What am I going to do? Based on what I know about threats, what is my plan? And I can tell you what it is. No one can, okay? But understanding what all the options are is important because you can develop your plan, you can be true to yourself. And more importantly, when something happens, you will be able to enact your plan. Not thinking about it at all puts you in a position where when the thing happens, when confronted with the threat, you now have to try and figure out your plan in the moment. That takes a tremendous amount of time for most people. And from a couple seconds, three to five seconds, to you know, two or three or four minutes, everything could be over by now. So understanding yourself, what are my capabilities? It's okay to like you what are my skills, what am I capable of? What, my skills? What, my what, where can I best be used in service of myself, my family, my community? Going to like I said earlier, right? If you have a plan, what is your plan to recover that and be separated? If you're here and something happens that's a that's a threat, an immediate emergent threat, people are gonna know what? They're gonna scatter. They're gonna run to the exits. Hopefully they're gonna run to the closest exit, they're gonna get out safely. What is your, your plan to recover the people you love, the people in your community, your family? You the development. 
No one can keep barricade is very important. Obviously, this space that can that can happen, right? This space would be an evacuation space. No one stays here in your threat, even if it's a fire, right? In some other locations in the building, based on your proximity to the threat, this is very important. Your proximity to the threat will dictate whether you evacuate or barricade. Or will it, it will inform that decision. It won't dictate it. Because the threat might be far away. <laughs> we'll talk about how to know that. But the threat might be relatively far away. It might be very near. But what if it's close and the space that you're in is not barricadable anyway? It's all glass windows. The, maybe maybe they're not they're not uh, ballistic rated windows. Maybe you're not able to stack these in front of the doors to slow someone down so that you can evacuate, right? So the important thing when people lock down so that you know ahead of time the space that I'm in is not something that I can lock down, not safely. So now I know that my plan almost always is going to have to be evacuated. Understand, brothers and sisters? Know the space that you're in and then develop your plan for that. Cover and concealment. Does anybody know the difference between cover and concealment? Any of our young guys in here play video games? Gonna, I'm going to define that. EMS number that I address. Personal medical kit and take a charge. Personal medical kit is important. Do, do, who, who here knows where the uh, first aid kits are in this facility? Off the top of your head. Is anyone? There's one on the stairs. Okay. Anyone else? That, that's, that's alerting to you, right? That's something that we should all know. I don't know. I didn't walk around and take mental notes. If someone's hurt, we want to try and have an understanding of where the closest thing is that can help, right? And if you don't have one, someone who works in classrooms or in separate areas that are isolated, maybe it's worth it to get your own trauma kit purchase your own trauma kit and have that in your location so that if something were to happen, you would not have to expose yourself to go get the first aid kit and bring it back. Also be aware, most first aid kits are not trauma kits. They're for boots and bruises, little burns, right? A trauma kit has a training kit, has a pressure boosting kit. Understand? And many people work with the leadership here uh, to try to get some trauma training to come here as well. Right? Because the, the, the number one killer of people during a, a high threat or during the event is hemorrhage. The number one number one killer of people is hemorrhage, loss of, loss of blood. Okay? So understanding how to apply a pressure dressing or a tourniquet is Often more important than no CPR. And then taking charge. Taking charge is, let me put it this way. I keep on moving very close. If someone were to come in here right now, up those stairs, or sneak in a back door, and attack us all right now while I was talking. Who would be in charge? Come on, brothers and sisters, talk to me. Say again? They would be in charge? I mean, who is behind the guy? Who would be in charge of telling, telling people what to do, where to go?
Yeah? You're almost there. He said, uh, depends on who's there, you know, who's alert, who the president, who's going to take charge. I can tell you, because we talked about it earlier, that we don't know how we're going to respond during a traumatic event. An emergency event, it might be none of you. It might be one of the 14 year old young brothers. It might be one of the sisters. The person who's in charge is the one who gets up and starts yelling at people to do things first. Understand? It doesn't, there's no rank, there's no position that matters in an emergency event. What matters is that someone is taking action. That person, even if you were me, if something were to happen and, and someone ran, ran up to my shoulder and grabbed me and said, Come on, pull off the doors, I'm not going to argue with them. Hey, I'm a shooter in this truck. You can't tell me what to do. I'm going to go lock the doors. Understand? Whoever takes charge and starts directing people is in charge until that works itself out, which can happen because sometimes people freeze. Right? There might be people in here who are absolutely in their mind ready to go when something happens. But when something happens, they freeze up for a second. Oh, it's happening. Someone else takes control for a minute or two, and then they can come back and say, okay, all right, I got it. Here's what we're going to do. They can develop a plan. Just because someone takes charge also doesn't mean that they're stuck in charge the entire event. There's no, none of this is written in stone. It all has to be fluid. And we all have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that our, our goal is to survive and help as many other people here also survive. That's the goal. No problems at all. All right, who can talk about the strategy strategy and attacking this? Yes. Yes. Your strategy is the overarching plan. Your tactics are all the small, small things you do to work yourself toward that goal. All the small decisions you make to stay alive, to keep your family alive, to keep your community alive. All the small things. For example, once again, right? We know that the overarching plan is to evacuate the space. And you move the same location and then take some kind of the probability of the people who are there alive and living. That's the move that you plan. Your tactics are how you move to the doors, which doors are locked, which doors are barricaded, what routes you take, who picks up a chair and smashes the back guy in the head with it. Those are all your tactics. So evacuate. Once again, understanding your your or you are in relation to all the exits. Entrances and exits are like that, as well as the windows. Being prepared to run for us of interference or obstacles. This often tends to be sticking As a community, we always want to help each other. Okay? The reality is some people are not able to help themselves, and you are also, you also may not be able to help. Them. And this has been played out multiple times in an active active shooter scenario. It's why it's become part of the process. Understanding that if you are trying to evacuate and someone, remember the color code we talked about earlier? Someone has shut down. They've gotten black. And you run up to them and say, come, 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 come. And they don't want to move, which I've seen happen. They crawl under a table, hide behind a desk, and they won't go anywhere. Brothers and sisters, you have to make peace with leaving that person there and saving your life. 
and or the lives of, like I said, your family, your children, the people who are going. Okay? This is a very, very difficult thing to do. On the law enforcement side, you would really have to do what you to And that would be an area. And people that are injured, our instinct is to try and render people. But that's not a job. The job is to move toward the threat and try to take that threat. Right? So in an energy shooter scenario, when law enforcement responds, they're going to stand by everyone who's in it and not go stop. Because the time they take to try and help someone who's injured or to evacuate people, that person might be doing more harm during that time. So the primary task for you is to make yourself safe. And the primary task for law enforcement is to stop that threat. All right, cover. Cover something solid, like steel doors, concrete walls, cement, cinder block. That is cover. Only thing that's not steel or concrete or print is concealment. Right? It just means that they can't see you. It does not mean that they can't shoot you. These doors back here, these wooden doors, they might be fire doors. They might not be. <laughs> fire doors are a problem. Wood all the way through. Most of the walls have a level of floor. Many doors that are metal or steel are aluminum with steel frame. Okay. Both of them go right through that. So you don't ever see behind something that you don't know for sure is hard. Or if you do, it's only for a second or two or a bit so you can move to the next thing, right? I tip this table over, I hide the money for a bit to try to see what's going on. I know it's concealment, probably. First chance I get, I get out and I run into something solid. And if this thing is not solid, First thing I get, I move to the next day. That's my group by the way, to something that I can't cover it. Or I move myself towards an exit. Understand? Cover and conceal is very important. The shooting that took place in Las Vegas at the MGM, the large open air concert where the gentleman, the man shot from the uh, hotel, down, right? A lot of people that were there. They, they hid under tables, folding tables, plastic and wood folding tables. Okay? Because, again, psychologically, if we, in many ways, when they're in threat, we become children. Okay? When, when you have a child and you cover, you cover your face, or you cover the child's face, what do they think? You're not there, you must be gone. Right? If I can't see you, you must not be able to see me. You must have disappeared and teleported something. Okay? Psychologically, unless we're paying attention, unless we're cognizant of it, right, we have to understand that just because you hide behind a thing does not mean that you're safe. Okay? You're only concealed for a moment until you move to a, a safer position. You should always be trying to maneuver yourself to a safer, safer position. Soft targets. Let's be honest. This is a soft target. A soft target does not have a significant amount of physical security in place. It does not have an on-guard security detail all the time it's occupied. Schools, they tend to be soft targets. Places of worship tend to be soft targets. We can't stop that. We can't avoid it. The only way to avoid that would be to lock down all the doors, pass them with a swipe card or checking IDs for everybody to come in and out. 
That's, that's an untimely solution. So what we do is we harden, if we cannot harden the facility, we harden the people. Okay? You collectively can make this a harder target by being aware, by letting everyone out there know that you are aware. Understand? Having a plan, discussing with each other, having safety on the line on a regular basis when you're outside, right? And always watching to see the environment, seeing when someone approaches who you're not accustomed to, right? Presence of the abnormal. So you can become the aspect of security that hardens this target. I have personally never been a proponent of that. That is not to say that it doesn't have its value. It does. Sometimes you have no choice. There have been times when the threat, people are presenting the threat without any warning, and it's right there. Right? The shooting is happening, and you know it's right in the hallway. If that you at that moment is not your best option, you don't have time for it. Maybe you don't have access to a So you must try to find a way to barricade. But I have to remind you, barricade, the idea of sheltering in place, it's a siege mentality. They always fail. Depending on the response time of law enforcement, barricades always can always fail. In Virginia Tech, that individual uh, who shot up the, the, the classroom in Virginia Tech, he went around and locked, he put chains on the doors on the outside. All the exits had chains and padlocks. He went to the second floor and started shooting. Some of the classrooms barricaded. Some did not. One of the last classrooms on that second floor barricaded the door. Second floor, the professor opened the window and had the students jump out. Again, second floor, didn't matter. Having a broken leg, probably a better idea than waiting to get shot in the face. Okay? All 23. 23 of the, of the students in that classroom escaped and lived. The barricade failed when that shooter worked his way down the hallway, killing students. The shooter got access to that door and killed the professor. You understand? Now, that professor saved a bunch of young lives. He is, without a doubt, a hero. But try to understand that we do not know how long it's going to take for help to come. So understand that if you barricade, you have a plan to barricade, whatever possible, you also have a plan to evacuate when that barricade fails. So rather than doing this, we're going to talk about. I told you this was going to be a little more interaction. In this space, is there anyone that spends time in one of the other rooms regularly? Classroom, office. No? Anyone here comes from me for a good one? Uh, okay. Well, this kind of goes back to understanding where you are in your space. Right? If you are one of the people who spend time here in one of the other rooms, teaching a class or doing something administrative or maintenance, it's important to know whether that's a space that you can barricade or not. Like I said earlier, if it's got glass, if it's got glass panes in the door that are not ballistic glass, you know that that door will fail even if you lock it. 
So now your options are, can I pile things up in front of that door to increase the time it takes for someone to penetrate? But in our mind, we know that's not going to stop something. It's simply going to delay something. And that has value. Right? Delaying someone on their task has a lot of value. Because what are we doing? We're increasing the time that we have to potentially get away. We're adding to that individual's time while hopefully, right, there is law enforcement on the way. The, so delaying has value. Slow the person down. Our, we have to try to understand that slowing the person down, stopping someone from achieving their goal, that also has a lot of value, even if it's just for seconds. Every second matters. We've got these vacuums here. Some of them have doors and windows. I haven't surveyed these spaces yet. But these are probably very good spaces to lock out if you have to. And these for a little while. Because those are those double doors, are, I think they're solid foot. Lock those up, pile everything in that room in front of that door. Now that's only valid. That's only valid, right? If we're in this space and we realize that there's a threat out in the main foyer, do we go lock ourselves in the room? No, right. You get out, right? Right? Because proximity informs your decision. Proximity to the threat, right? Some people can react to the other, right? So now, let's switch that around. When we're here, conducting our prayers, listening to the Jula prayer, and then someone works their way all the way up into the space and begins shooting. What do we do then? Proximity to the threat, right? Some people, absolutely, your best option might be just running it in that door and lock it. Some people might get up and try and attack that person. That's what I feel in my heart, right? These make great weapons. One of the other things that we have to try to understand, and I'm, I'm going to segue a little bit. I'm going to segue a little bit. Our population at large, we are deathly afraid of firearms. Okay? Because most of us don't shoot them ever. Never hold one. Has anyone here ever fired a gun before? Two people. To most people, to most people, a gun might as well be a nuclear weapon. To most people, the idea of someone coming in here and shooting in their mind, in their heart, everyone's going to know. What we have to try and do is demystify guns. Take the power away. We have to do it. A gun is only deadly in one direction at a time. A gun is a mechanical piece of equipment. It can fail. You can make it fail. Maybe one of the next time that I come, I'll bring some training devices here and we'll work on them as a skill. Because it's been done many, many times. People, citizens, stop shooters. As a matter of fact, in the longest time, most active shooter events were either the shooter committed suicide because a lot of people are away, or citizens stop the shooter themselves. Okay? And I'm not talking about citizens with guns. I'm not talking about the good guy with the gun argument. During this past summer, at a church in San Diego, a man is under 
And the physician was the first one to relax. A physician tried to attack the head and tackled him. The physician was shot and killed. We never followed him. We requested him to take charge. That physician, his first instinct was to go toward that threat and try and stop that gun. And when people saw that, they reacted as well, and they went with him. And that man didn't kill anyone else. We have power. We have the ability to stop things. If you fear the power of the firearm, it has power over you. And the more people that you can get to understand that we can do something, that we can be empowered to do something, the things that all of us are. Absolutely. Okay. So the, the brother's statement was understanding that there's the different kind of firearms affect that person's ability to to do more damage fast. That's absolutely true. Okay. But one gun can only point one direction at a time. Okay. So where this is pointed is where the threat is. Number one. Number two, 99.9% of people who participate in killing mass, mass killings, they are not trained shooters. These aren't law enforcement people, you know, they're not military trained people. They're some crazy person who's afraid of something in their life, or they were, they were treated badly, that they think they want to hurt as many people as possible. Okay? I'm not saying that no one will get hurt. I'm saying that doing something makes less people get hurt. Okay? And we can work on the mechanics of that next time. Okay? Fast thinking leads to fast responding. How do we increase our fast thinking? I talked about it a little bit earlier. How do we make it so that we can respond more quickly? Being prepared, right? Being prepared doesn't mean coming here this one time that I talk. Being prepared means you are thinking about this on a regular basis. Being prepared means that you have your personal response plan. In your mind, you know this area, this facility, and you know that if something were to happen, what your plan is to do. My plan is if, if something happens, it is far away, I know exactly what door I'm going to go out. I know exactly where in the parking lot I'm going to go. I know exactly who I'm going to get first. If it happens where I'm close, I know exactly what door I'm going to go I know exactly how I'm going to lock that door, and I know exactly what I'm going to pile up in front of that door. I have my phone. Ready to go. I know exactly what number I'm going to call. Right? Having that plan is important. And if you have your plan, you can enact it immediately. And now you greatly reduce the time it takes for something for your response. Right? Having your plan makes fast thinking. Fast thinking is fast response. We're going to get into this next time that I come, or in the near future. Believe it or not, I have training partners that will come here with a big old suit. And for those of you who are involved in the safety team, or even in the community, you can practice attacking somebody with a gun, and I will show you how easy it is to stop someone who's trying to do harm. Okay? It's not hard. Remember, we 
we're all flesh and blood. None of us are magic. None of us have power. No superheroes. No super villains. Okay? This works the same on every person. Right? All the joints work the same. So we'll show you how to, how to stop someone to try to be to try to cause damage. Right? Understanding body mechanics, isolating the body, where is the threat, and always trying to secure the weapon. I'm going to go ahead and I was going to tie this up here because this involves everyone getting up and moving around. Okay? The last thing I'll mention about that, though, before we leave, remember I spoke a little bit earlier about the, the nightclub fire in Rhode Island? Right? Those people died at the door because they couldn't move and they couldn't get away, they got stuck. Okay? When everyone is trying to go out one door at the same time, everyone fails. Right? So part of this is understanding how crowds react. Understanding how crowds react during a high threat scenario is very, very important. I know that you all love each other. We all love this community. Human instinct sometimes cancels out our ability to behave like humans. During a high threat scenario, people might step on you. People might pull you aside to try and get out because the fear has become too powerful. So understanding how how crowds react is very important. In uh, during the World Cup, I think some years ago. Uh, I forget what it was. There was some kind of mass exodus from the stadium. Right? The fences all collapsed. Thousands of people tried to move. Oh, Korea. Just a couple weeks ago. 150 people were killed in Korea because of a, a mass, mass crush of people bodies. Right? And that wasn't even an emergency event. There was no fire. There was no shooting. That's just a bunch of people crowded in two, two, two types of space. Right? Right? So during these mass these emergency events, people stop caring about the community and only care about themselves. So part of your plan is to understand that the people that you love in your community might also be a threat to you and your family while you're trying to escape. Right? If there were 200 people in here right now, and we all had to leave, a portion of those people would also be a threat. Not maliciously. Okay? Just based on, on human instinct. We're working a little bit on this. I can show you, I have methods to show you how to navigate tight traps. Next time we, we, I come here, I'm going to talk a lot less, and we're going to get out and we're going to do a lot more. Okay? We'll show them off. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end that here. This gets much more um, So I'll stop. Again, I'll be doing a second part to this that has um, practical exercises involved. We'll get up and we'll, we'll do some things that you can use right away. I hope that some of the information that you've heard here today at least can stay with you. Right? Remember that the more you think about the thing, the more it becomes part of you. Let me ask you one last question before we go. So that it hits home. What is one of the reasons we pray five times a day? In relation to all of this, what is one of the reasons? We can think of it. Just throw ideas at Yes. Say again. Fear of Allah. Fear of Allah. Uh, yes, that's one of the reasons. Protection from evil. 
All those are good reasons. If you don't, immunity, protect each other? Absolutely. I'll give you this because it's an analogy more than a direct lesson, okay? One of the reasons we pray so often is so that in the time periods that we're not praying, we can still think about the law. Right? The more often we think about something, the more it's integrated in us. Right? We pray five times a day so that we think about a law all day. Understand? We're closer to a law because we're thinking about it all day in our thoughts, right? This is similar, not the same. Similar. The more often you think about things that improve your safety, the closer it becomes to you, and the easier it is to have these things going on in your mind. They become second nature. Understand? That's one of the reasons that doing these kind of things often is important. Because it helps bring it from the back of the line back to the front. Okay? My brothers and sisters, I appreciate you allowing us, allowing me to come here today and hopefully help improve your safety personally and as a community. Inshallah, I'll be back here a couple more times throughout the course of the year. And we can do a whole lot more from improving the physical security to actually making many of you able to intervene if something happens in this space. Oh, well, that's a whole other lesson. So I'm done here today, but I will be back before you talk to the lobby. If anyone has questions, you can already reach out to me. Okay. My website, my email, please. If you have questions about your home, if you have questions about your business, even your work, your work, please feel free to email me. I always answer, and I will always help. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.